I mainly want to, I want to talk about chronology and the calendar. Um, the calendar, I was saying jokingly to somebody just a minute ago, it's the most important thing to uh, a biblically based religion. In a certain way, it's the most important functional thing. There can be beliefs. People can sit and hold certain ideas in their head and in their heart and say, this I believe, right? Confess the creeds. But what if they want to show up at the right time for a gathering? And uh, obviously, if there were no days of the week, we'd be in complete chaos. So we have a seven-day week. And Christians generally gather on Sunday, the first day of the week, and Jews gather on Saturday or the Shabbat on the seventh day of the week. And so we're like 24 hours apart, sort of like the tomb of David in the upper room. You know, there's that three feet of floor that separates the two, but they're in the same spot. So Christians have, and Jews have clustered together temporally for centuries. But then beyond that, Christians are keeping Easter and Lent and Christmas and other feast days. Uh, Pentecost would be one that they share, but not on the same day. And Jews, in the book of Leviticus, if you don't know these feasts, I think most of you certainly have heard of Passover. But in Leviticus 23, there's a, there's a nice chronological list of the festivals of the Lord, right? The Mo'edim, the, or the Chagim, celebrations of the Lord. And basically, they cluster in the first month, the third month, and the seventh month. And one way of counting them, you would have seven. So you would have Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, which would be eight days altogether, or seven, depending on how you count the first one. And then approximately 50 days after that, you would have Pentecost, 50, or Shavuot. And then you wait all the way till, till the seventh month, right? Uh, this is the seventh month of a 12-month year, or a 13-month year, depending on the year. And in the seventh month, on that very first day of the seventh month, you have <coughs> what Jews call popularly, and the culture calls uh, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. But actually, in the Bible, it's the Feast of the Blast. You're supposed to have a blast on that day. You're supposed to actually blast the trumpet or shout. And then uh, on the 10th day of that month is Yom Kippur. You've all heard of that, the day of covering, described in Leviticus chapter 16. And then on the 15th day of that month is Sukkot, or the day of dwelling in booths or tabernacles, or some sort of temporary dwelling. So, and then on the eighth day of that feast, there's a final celebration. So you have this cycle, and those uh, days, have within themselves, those festival days, annual Sabbaths as well. So there's a weekly Sabbath every seventh day, right? But then the first day of unleavened bread, the 15th of the first month, Nisan as it's called, is also a Sabbath. So you could have a back-to-back -back Sabbath, theoretically, right? Uh, Yom Kippur, you could have uh, it as a, it could fall on any day really, on in the biblical calendar. So you have to, we're going to focus more on, on Judaism, but you could see how it would apply for Christians too. So Jews had these calendar disputes also in the time of the Second Temple. We're kind of focusing on Second Temple Judaism. That's my field. That's what I mainly talk about. And what we began to pick up is the, well, let me start like this. The standard Jewish calendar today, look, it says Jewish calendar. There you go. Uh, the way to know the Jewish calendar today, unless you want to do a lot of math, which is possible to do, and you can go to the Jewish Encyclopedia, it's online, print out the article on Jewish calendar, and you could actually do the math with a calculator. You wouldn't have to use this. But it would really be a waste of time because it's all done for you. There are all kinds of uh, extra days and intercalations and whether there's a 13th month or 12 months, just buy the calendar, please. It's easier. So you can open up and you can say, okay, if I go to, um, this is a pretty nice calendar here. I'm going to go to this month, July 209. It says Tammuz and today is the 17th 
or 16th actually on this. No, it isn't, I'm sorry. 17th of Tammuz is today, which is actually a fast day in Judaism. So if I'm Jewish and I'm observing Torah, according to rabbinic Judaism, I would not be eating today, right? Because uh, how do I know? Because I looked on my Jewish calendar and it says 17th of Tammuz. That's a fast day. It's commemorating several disasters in Jewish history, including the Golden Calf Incident. So it's a very sad day. It's a day of mourning. So the standard Jewish calendar, often called the Hillel calendar, that was fixed after the fall of the Second Temple is essentially a calculated calendar. What people find out when they begin following it is if they have a little pocket calendar, you know, just a normal secular calendar, they'll see in their calendar a new moon written. And then they'll look in the Jewish calendar and the new moon might be a day, two days, even three days different. And they'll think, well, it's not the new moon because your secular calendar is using astronomy. I mean, we can predict the new moons within seconds, right? And so the Jewish calendar is not always in sync with the actual new moon. So there's a difference between an observed calendar, you know, where you really look and say, oh, there's the new moon, this must be the first day of the month, and a printed calendar that all Jews worldwide generally would follow, you see. And basically the shortcut is just to have, buy one, to have one. They're available on the web, they're available everywhere else. So that's the observed calendar. No, I mean the calculated modern calendar. We're not going to talk about that because we're dealing with Second Temple Judaism. What we're going to deal with today is, I think, more interesting from the standpoint of Jesus, the Dead Sea Scrolls, early Christianity, and that is there were two competing calendars. This calendar didn't exist then. Nobody's using this, nobody. This is later constructed, and it, do, it is the point, it does serve Jews in the diaspora well, because instead of trying to, I mean, today we have the internet and you could communicate, but instead of trying to figure out what the rabbis in Jerusalem are saying or not saying, or if they're debating about things, you, it can all be done. Uh, I have Spearer's book that some of you have on the Jewish calendar. I can tell you when Yom Kippur will be in the year, you know, 2075 or something. I forget when the book stops, but you see, it's already, ahead. everything is set ahead of time. I do find it useful if I'm looking back, particularly in the 20th or 19th century, and I like to know when something happened, because it, it's like a, a record of, you know, what day was, uh, say, the Six-Day War, wh where was it in the Jewish calendar, or that sort of thing. So forget all that, that was the introduction. <laughs> in other words, that's to clear the deck so we can talk about what was going on in the first century. Nobody had this printed calendar and nobody was doing these calculations. Instead, there were two competing calendars. One is a solar calendar and one is a solar lunar, sort of. <laughs> Let's start with the solar. In Genesis 1.14, we read that the sun and the moon rule the skies and they are for signs, seasons, days, and years. So here's the idea that by, by using the sun and the moon, that would be solar, lunar, you're able to determine signs, whatever that means. Seasons is actually the word moadim, which is also a word used for the festivals or literally it's to a point or meet. So you might think of it as divine appointments. You're supposed to meet God on a certain day, right? So there would be, it says in Leviticus, on the 15th day of the first month, you shall have a solemn assembly, and you eat no unleavened bread, and it's a Sabbath to the Lord. Well, that could be any day of the week, right? Because it's the day of a month, right? And so if you're following those Torah teachings, you would need to know when that is, and it would be an appointment, you might say, a meeting that you would have with your fellow believers as well as God. Now here's the problem. It's just an astronomical problem that I think you're all aware of. <laughs> there are 365.242199 days in a solar year. That is the time it takes the Earth uh, to go around the sun, right? so that we come back again. We roughly have adjusted that with our 
Julio-Gregorian calendar with our leap years and so forth that it works out pretty well. So if my birthday is March 2nd, uh, unless it's a leap year when it would be 24 hours off, I can say, you know, I was born so many years ago today and roughly I'm in the same spot around the sun within 24 hours depending on the leap year. We humans like that sort of thing, don't we? In German we call it Jahrzeit. This is the day when my mother died. This is the day when this happened. Just, it's the temporal uh, equivalent of touching, remember when I talked about touching artifacts, like holding a coin, walking on a step, going up to the temple or where Jesus was tried, or any other figure of antiquity. If you touch the past, I think it's that same emotion that comes to bear. It's a rational, emotive kind of reaction. It's rational because you're going, this is it, but it's emotive because you're getting a feeling about it, right? And we love that sort of thing. Uh, most of us order our lives that way, you know. For 10 years to the day, I've been screwing up my life, but today I'm gonna change. You know, you like that. You want <laughs> New Year's resolutions, new beginnings, new things. Well, the Bible's the same way. When Israel comes out of Egypt, Exodus 12, verse 40, very interesting verse. Nobody, no scholar accepts it, but whoever wrote it accepts it. Uh, I, I think I might uh, be willing to uh, 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 consider it. And, but what it says is, it's very important for understanding biblical, biblical chronology that the Israelites come out of Egypt 430 years on the same day. And then everybody debates in terms of chronology what, on the same day of what? Perhaps Abraham's call or Abraham's circumcision or the birth of Isaac, those are three proposals that all seem to work somewhat. But the point is it says, on this day. And when Moses gives his last speech in Deuteronomy, he says, Hayom Hazay, today I am 120 years old. Is he being general or was it his birthday? See? So you get that sort of thing. The idea of something happening on the same day. Uh, I happened to teach at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. It was founded on March 2nd, 1946. That's my birthday. I don't know that that matters, but it's sort of odd, isn't it? My daughter was born in uh, Williamsburg, Virginia on February 8th, and that's the day William and Mary was founded and I was teaching at William and Mary. So we find all these kind of chronological convergences in our lives. If you sit down with a pen and paper, you can come up with all sorts of things with birthdays and your kids' births and your parents, and if you do genealogy, it gets really uncanny. You start looking at those death dates. And I'm not talking about astrology, just the way, the times and the seasons, right? So the calendar keeps that straight. Now the lunar month is 29.530587. So if you do 12 new moons, 12 lunar months, you're only going to get about 354 days, you see that? leaving 11 days short for the solar year. So this is the problem. So what are you going to do? If you're, the Mus if you're with the Muslims, you ignore it. But what will happen then if every year, your year, which is, 12, is uh, 354 days, is uh, that long and the solar year is 365, your months, your seasons are going to move around. Passover needs to be in the spring, don't you think? I mean, it's the festival of spring. You'll end up keeping Passover in the dead of winter one year. It'll move 11 days every year. Have you ever noticed Ramadan? You think Ramadan, I think it's in the seventh month, isn't it, on the Muslim calendar? But it, it moves 11 days a year. So over the years, you kind of forget and you go, oh, the Muslims are keeping Ramadan. It's January, and then later, Muslims are keeping Ramadan. It's the middle of summer, it's really hot. Because they're not doing anything to keep the 12 lunar months in line with the solar. So do you see the problem? These things don't mesh perfectly. So if you're going to count your months by the appearance of the moon and then wait 29 days, uh, you're not going to come out with the solar year. So there has to be some way of putting together the solar and the lunar. Any questions on that? Because this gets kind of technical. I want to be sure you follow me. Okay, what the rabbinic calendar does, this one, that I told you to forget for a minute, now you've got to go back to it just for a minute, is it calculates 
in a 19 year period has 12 common years with 12 moons, but seven leap years have 13 months. So you'll have 13 month years. We don't have to do that in our calendar because we have 30 and 31 days plus leap year that's worked it all out to 365 and then we make up the quarter day, right, every four years. So we, but if you're going to have the same length of month, uh, you're, you're going to have to add seven times in 19 years a second month. So what are you going to add? Basically you go to the 12th month and just say, okay, should be 12 and then 1 again, right? You say, no, it's not 1, it's 13. What it does, it, it sort of shakes the system back. But see, it's all, if you look at the years, it's doing it in the 3rd, 6th, 8th, 11th, 14th, 17th, and 19th year. So you're off for a couple years, but not that much. You say 11 days, then another 11 days, and then the third time, oh, let's catch up so you can pull it all back again. So it'll roughly work out that you're keeping Passover or around the spring because you'll catch up every three years. Sounds kind of cumbersome, doesn't it? But it does work in a certain way. I mean, have you ever noticed? Why does uh, Passover, you say, is it in March or April? See, see what's happening? It depends on whether that extra month has been added because one of the greatest controversies in the early Nazarene movement or in the Catholic Church, really, was whether to set Easter by the Jewish uh, observance of Passover. And all the Eastern churches were doing that. And they were keeping Easter as the Sunday after the Jewish Passover. And at that time, the Jewish Passover was being done by uh, observation. So you would have to watch Jews. Now you're a Gentile Christian, but you've got to ask the Jews, When's Passover? Because I want to know when to keep Easter. <laughs> and so you're going to the rabbis. The church fathers did not like this in the West. So several of the popes, or let's call them bishops of Rome, there are two waves of controversy in the second century. It, it, all, it just really split the group because there were those who traced themselves back to the Apostle John and to Polycarp and Papias who said, we're not going to change we're going to do it the way we always did it. It goes back to the Lord that he ate the last supper on the night before Passover. And so we're going to eat the memory of the last supper and then keep Sunday Easter that week of Passover. And in the West, they excommunicated all the churches of Asia Minor because they wouldn't change. And they wanted to tie it to the vernal equinox and forget the Jews and Passover. So sometimes it'll be close, other times it won't be close, has no association whatsoever. <clears throat> so uh, it's floating. And eventually the great church accepted that, except for small dissident groups that said, no, we're still going to follow um, Passover. But see, to do that, even as a Christian, you would have to know the Jewish calendar, you see, in order to even keep Easter and to keep Pentecost, because Pentecost is tied to Easter. So, um, that's the problem that occurs with the solar lunar. You're going to have to figure out some way to make it work because it's 11 days off. Now, we come to the Essenes, the so-called Jubilees calendar. It's a solar calendar. All of a sudden, you ignore the moons. Moons don't matter because the actual word for moon, right here, or month, month comes from moon, is just the word uh, kodesh, or kadosh rather. It just means new. And so their understanding was, if you say this month, this is Exodus 12, will be for you the first of the news of the year, not news like good news, but of the new things. Uh, of the turning of the year, then you, you could make an argument that it doesn't have to do with the moon. It doesn't say this moon, right? Yareach, it says this new, meaning new 30-day period. That's how they understand it. A month is 30 days, so this new, meaning this new 30-day period will be here, and then another 30 and another 30. So what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Book of Jubilees and other texts of the late Second Temple period are sectarian groups 
that are willing to go to battle and break off from other groups who are following this lunar solar calendar that is so kind of wacky, you know, needing all these adjustments and things, and they love the feeling of harmony of the solar calendar. If you get rid of the new moons, there's no problem. So what, what they did, they constructed 52 weeks. A week is easy, of 30 days each. That gives you 360 days, and then you got to make up for the five days, right, and a quarter. And they would add extra days, uh, 31 months, four different times, see right there. We don't know what they did about the lost quarter year. Some scholars think they didn't know about it and left it out, and that's why their calendar, it's not going to drift 11 days, which you would notice within three years, you would say. It's a little bit cold or a little bit hot, depending on, but if it's a quarter of a day, and we're, we're talking about an apocalyptic group that begins to arise and follow this teaching around the time of the Teacher of Righteousness, let's just say roughly 150 BC, and if their calendar is getting off a quarter day a year, that's actually good for them because they think the cosmos is coming apart. And start, so they start saying, you know, normally Passover, have you noticed it's getting colder or warmer? This must be a sign that we're near the end because the heavens are beginning to, to fall apart. You know, the seasons are beginning to um, collapse. Uh, as Paul says, the, the form of this world is passing away. Okay, now here's where it really gets interesting. Um, the solar, we can construct it from the Dead Sea Scrolls. We almost could construct it from Jubilees, but there were a few questions, but now it's, it's, it works out pretty well. Here are your 12 months. Forget the 13 months, because you're just going to have the solar year. And I put in red the feast days. What the sectarians just loved about this is every day of the month corresponds to a day of the week forever and ever. So if you were born, let's pick a day. You were born on the second month on the sixth day. Every year, on the second day of the sixth month, you'll go, oh, here's Wednesday, it's my birthday again. Doesn't that feel good? I feel like the cosmos is kind of in sync, don't you? Not all this changing around, adding things. It's the same as the day I was born 50 years ago. And so you can begin to associate these days with Sabbaths. I was born on a Sabbath on this day, and my grandfather was this. You begin to feel like this, oh, God is a God of perfection. He's not going to create some crazy chaotic thing that doesn't fit, like moons don't fit solar, and you've got to add things. So this is much better, don't you think? I think we should switch to this. How about you? And how nice that Passover is always going to be Tuesday night. On the first month, and I won't have to go out and look at the moon like some pagan moon watcher. I can just, I, I can count to 12, and then I can count to 12 again and again and again. What harmony, what peace. God originally created this. Genesis 1, verse 14. I believe it was the fourth day, we call it Wednesday, when the sun and moon were made. So I think the year ought to start on a Wednesday because the first... In other words, we are in harmony now with the way things were uh, just a few days before Adam and Eve were made. See? So this was extremely satisfying to these people. And I don't know what they did with the leap year, but you see how in months 3, 6, 9, and 12, they're adding the 31. So that's going to catch you up to the 364. See that? And then they've got to just, uh, they had a dead day, I think, for the five, and we don't know what they did for the quarter. But uh, I put in red where, when these festivals, festivals would occur, like in the first and seventh month, you're going to have, this would be New Year's Day, Wednesday. This would be Passover. This would be the last day of unleavened bread. This would be Yom Kippur. And let's see, this would be Shavuot, so we can always figure out uh, the 50 days because it's always going to be on Sunday, the 15th of the third month. So other than them not working out the leap year, and maybe they did have a way to figure out that day and a half. I mean, there are different schemes people come up with. Uh, 
they're convinced that this is the harmonious way. Now, let me show you how important this is to them in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Remember, in the community rule, the teacher hasn't shown up as far as we can tell. And based on what the Damascus document says, the community itself, ruled by its primitive precepts, has gone into the wilderness to prepare the way. But as they look back on the coming and going of the teacher, remember we covered this? They said, we were like blind men stumbling in the way. This is very loaded language. If you stumble in the way, the way, capital W, Haderic, God's true way. So, no doubt the teacher straightened out many things, but I'm thinking one of the great things he straightened out was the calendar. Because they, he delivered to them a calendar that was so perfect and harmonious in their eyes that they suddenly just felt not only are we in harmony with God, but we're in harmony with the heavens and the seasons and everything is perfect. And those corrupt priests in Jerusalem that are looking at moons and adding months and, you know, kind of trying to change everything, uh, this is one of the reasons God is not pleased with them. So in the community rule, there's nothing about the calendar that I can find particularly, nothing directly. But notice in the Damascus document with uh, manuscript A and B when the teacher has come, listen to this. This is from column three of the Damascus document. You ready? But with the remnant, that's us, right? The people, which held fast to the commandments of God, he made his covenant with Israel forever. Now they're talking about themselves. They're calling themselves the remnant of Israel. Does that remind you of anything in the New Testament? <laughs> Doesn't Paul say, and now there's a remnant and other New Testament writers talk about a remnant? revealing to them the hidden things in which all Israel had gone astray. All Israel has, has lost this. What is this? He unfolded to them his holy Sabbath and his glorious feasts, the testimonies of his righteousness and the ways of truth. Um, then, there's, that's the first reference. There are a number of other references let me see if there's another one. I'll just read you. For God has, this is column 16, God has made a new covenant with you, now it's very personal, and with all Israel, therefore a man shall bind himself by oath to return to the law of Moses. As for the exact determination of their times, the times being the ma'adim, the appointments, the exact determination. What this would mean is that Jews in Jerusalem are sitting down to Pesach, the Seder meal, at a different day than this group. Uh, Ani Joubert and Father Pixner and others have suggested that that lies behind the discrepancy in the Gospels between John and the Synoptics and the Passover meal and so forth that in fact Jesus might have been following the Essene calendar so he would have the Passover on a Tuesday night, and the rest of the society would be doing it on a Thursday night or a Friday night, I mean, a thir or a Wednesday night, depending on how you understand the calendar. I've never been convinced that that's the case, but I've read it and tried to, you know, listen and see whether that seems to work out. But you can see that sociologically it's a tremendous difference. What about Yom Kippur? This is the holiest day when God atones. On this day, he's going to take away your sins. And you're doing it on the wrong day or a different day than the other group. So the exact determination of the times to which Israel turns a blind eye. So this group is saying the rest of my fellow Jews are blinded. Behold, it is strictly defined in the book of the divisions of the times into weeks and jubilees. And so they had various things. For example, they would meet at Shavuot in the third month on that 15th day and do the renewing of the covenant because they believe that's the day Moses got the law from Sinai. And the Pharisees and Sadducees are going to have a different uh, practice. 
Now, in the Habakkuk Pesher, you get a very interesting line that we can now understand based upon this calendar. And it actually is pretty chilling to think about how you can take advantage of a religious group that's keeping a certain day that you're not keeping. The Greeks learned this very quickly during Maccabean times and pre-Maccabean times. It's described in the Book of Maccabees. These Jews rest on the seventh day. What a great day for the attack, the main attack. The Arabs in 73 took advantage of this. We call it what today? The war. The Yom Kippur War. Uh, ask anyone in Israel who was there then, they'll have a story. What I was doing that morning, most uh, were in synagogues fasting, and all of a sudden the air raid alarms go off and so forth. What a brilliant move on the part of Egypt and Syria and Iraq and the other nations. Now what about this? This is Habakkuk Pesher about the teacher. Habakkuk 2.15, in a very obscure verse, I think, that we would agree, what does this mean? Woe to him who causes his neighbor to drink, who pours out his venom to make them drunk, that he may gaze on their feasts. I mean, you would have to put that back into Habakkuk's time and try to interpret it in terms of the uh, Babylonian period. But not this group. Remember, every line of prophecy is a line for us, telling us something about our own situation, right? Interpreted, this concerns the wicked priest who pursued the teacher of righteousness to the house of his exile, that he might confuse him with his venomous fury. And at the time appointed for rest, on the Day of Atonement, he appeared before them to confuse them and cause them to stumble on the day of fasting, their Sabbath of repose. This is a Yom Kippur war in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's, it's, it's a small war, but whoever this priest is, he looks at their calendar and he says, you know, about 10 this morning, 11, 12, they're going to be very weak. They're keeping Yom Kippur. He's, this is a priest, a Jewish priest. He's keeping it on a different day, according to the moons, right? So they're not fasting on the same day. So he appeared, perhaps at Qumran, if that is the place of exile, or maybe at Damascus. And whether he physically did something, but it says he attacked them with his venomous fury on the day of fasting. So isn't that interesting? And you could do that because the groups are keeping different days. So what's the problem? Uh, why did this not last? Uh, I think the problem has to do with a tradition deeply embedded within Judaism that the term kadosh here really does refer to the new moon not just the new whatever, meaning the new 30-day period that I calculated on my calculator. It's a thing that happens. And we have so many references to sighting the moon and when the moon appears that this calendar, although it has a feeling of mathematical harmony, and by the way, it's also synced with the equinox uh, because that first Wednesday of day one is the first uh, Wednesday after the vernal equinox, so it stays exactly with the seasons. So all of that, uh, which was on its side positively, I think was countered by a sense that these new moons that are talked about in the Bible and observed, where somebody will say, did you see the new moon? Or on the new moon I'll appear, that it doesn't seem to be a calculated 30-day period where you need your calculator, this is great if you've got it, this cheat sheet, but if you didn't have this cheat sheet, how would you know any of this? Can you see the vernal equinox? You can't? No. And then throughout the year, you'd have to look. It's, it's very much like this. You'd have to look, wouldn't you? You'd have to have it down or a really good memory to say, okay, 30, 30, 30, up, 31, 30, 30, 30, 31. You have to have all that down. Well, they had that down. Actually, in the scrolls, they express it in just a paragraph or two. 
you know, they're able to summarize which days are this and which days are that with a little chart like this, actually. It's, actually, it's in the scrolls. But you see the dissatisfaction with it. Now, finally, what about the, so we got two calendars, both of which you really need printed copies of. This can be one sheet, which is kind of convenient. You can put it in your wallet. This you need to come out every year, and you can't use last year's. So this is really better in a way for convenience, but this has the new moons, so that's sort of appealing. So which one would you choose? If you were Jewish, I mean, you want to keep God's feast on the Passover. Whoever does not keep this feast is cut off from the people. You got to do it. You want to do it, right? Celebrate. And you want to say, on this day our fathers came out of Egypt. You don't want to make it some other day, right? And you want to do it together. Well, you know, this is really strange, but I can give you a calendar with two rules. You don't need a piece of paper, you don't need anything printed, and it'll work forever and ever perfectly and it'll never get out of sync. Aren't I smart? <laughs> it's the calendar Abraham used, it's the calendar uh, I think all the ancients used, it's the calendar the American Indians used. It's the calendar the Muslims try to use, but they make one mistake because they don't have a spring festival if they cared about the seasons. So what are the two rules? Rule number one, look in the sky and when you see the new moon, that's day one of the month. That's easy, assuming it's not a cloudy day, right? So there have to be decisions made about where is it visible and so forth, but there's going to be general, it can actually be predicted. But this idea of sighting the moon is part of the process of certifying, and this was done anciently, that you can sight the moon and say, okay, this is the month. And you're not calling the months by their Babylonian names, Nisan and Tammuz and so forth, you just, month one. So you count 12, that's easy, 12 new moons, doesn't this sound like American Indians? And they kept the seasons in line because they would say, in the moon of the falling of the leaves. You know, they had names for it, right? So it stays in harmony. In the moon, of, and if they weren't figuring out how to add the 11 days, it wouldn't work because the moon of the falling of the leaves would be pretty different after a few years, wouldn't it? Leaves wouldn't be falling. So you follow? So you, you see the new moon and you then count 12 of those. And after 12, you have to make a decision as to whether that year to add the 13th or not. But you don't do it mathematically. You look at the barley harvest in the land of Israel. And if the barley is going to be ripe in time for the Passover week, basically, with the waving of the wave sheaf, which is the first fruits, then you don't add a month because it's in sync. And if it isn't going to be ripe, if the grain is hard, and you know in 15 days that no way are we going to be able to harvest that wheat or that barley. Then you add, you say, okay, let's call this 13, right? And then the next month will work. So those are the two rules. And it goes with the seasons, and if the weather changes or anything changes, it'll adjust. And uh, you just go on forever with that uh, particular calendar. So that's the observed calendar. Uh, there are Jewish groups that are returning to this. Actually, uh, Nehemiah Gordon is a Karite, a uh, member of a Jewish, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, today we talk about reform, in America at least, and Reconstructionists and conservative and orthodox. This is an older division between, I guess, rabbinic Judaism and the Karaites. I would liken the Karaites more to the Protestants in the sense that the Karaites said, we just want to follow the Bible, not all the traditions of men and all the traditions of the elders. And the uh, rabbis would say more like Roman Catholics, oh, it's fine to follow the Bible, but we'll tell you how to do it, right? Because we've already made all those interpretations for you. So it's not exactly parallel, but the, all religions have this, by the way. Muslims have the same thing, Buddhists have the same thing. You have groups that are trying to follow more literally the text and groups that rely on the tradition through the ages to tell the people what the text says. Just a classic division of religion.